Back to gravity gradients. To summarize from last time, we did come up with the conditions for gravity gradient equilibrium. Not yet stability, but for equilibrium. The conditions are that if you have the orbit frame, right, we've got the orbit frame there that's along the track. O1 is in the direction of the orbit. O3 is the local vertical. And then O2 is normal to the orbit. The conditions for equilibrium are just that the principal axis body frame is parallel. It doesn't mean they're exactly matching up. There's, I think, 24 different ways they could be parallel to each other. Parallel, meaning maybe you have O1 aligned with uh, B3 or something. So that's equilibrium. It should make sense. Think in terms of the barbell. Here's a barbell. This is a five pound weight. So if it's this way, you know, Earth's down, this is an equilibrium. Is it stable? Probably not. If I move it a little bit, well, there's going to be a greater force over here than over here. So this is probably going to get pulled away from that. This is also an equilibrium. And is it stable? Well, if I move this a little bit away, there's more force down here. So it's probably going to bring it back. But we can get the mathematical conditions. The problem with the barbell is it's kind of symmetrical about this direction. So you don't get all three moments of inertia entering in, right? So the space shuttle, if it's in orbit, it could be going like this, or it could be going like this, it could be going like this, it could be going like that. I mean, there's all kinds of ways. 24, pick the ones that are stable. And it's not that just one, uh, set of attitudes. When I ask for attitudes of equilibrium that are stable, maybe more than one. First, we have to get those conditions for stability. So we need to go back to what we had last time, just kind of setting up all the ingredients we need to write Euler's equations. Right, this is what we want to do. We want to write Euler's equations. We're writing it this way, plus LG. So equilibrium corresponds to omega dot change in angular velocity going to zero. Stability will be something additional where there will be restoring torques taking you at least not away from equilibrium if you have a slight departure. Let's say one degree, we don't want that to lead to instability. So all of the ingredients are not quite there. Gravity gradient in terms of the body fixed principal axis frame, LG1, LG2, LG3, and this was 3 G, M, E. That G, M is what the mu parameter. So it's something like 10 to the 14 in SI units. And then distance from the center of the earth. So that would be what the centimeter axis. And then this combination of RC1s, RC2s, and then the moments of inertia. I1, it's along the B1 axis. I2 is along the B2 and I3, B3. But then for sake of clarity, we said that B3 is definitely in the O3 direction, or it starts out near the O3 direction so that we can then start analyzing. Next component was RC1, RC3, I1 minus I3. And then the last one, RC1, RC2, I2 minus I1. And what are all of these components? We're writing this vector distance from the center of the earth, but as seen in the body fixed frame. So this is RC, but in the O3 direction. And we're just writing the components that result from that. I in the body fixed frame is, because it's a principal axis frame, I1, I2, and I3. We also wrote omega and omega dot in terms of Euler angles. So omega dot, how the angular velocity changes with time. And this is approximate because we're making a small angle approximation writing in terms of yaw, pitch, and roll. So for example, the yaw angle is rotation about the O2 direction. So if I were to draw it here, this would be, um, that would be pitch. Um, then yaw would be and roll the other things. So we've got this, this is all again from last time, but necessary ingredients to do our analysis. So we had that, and then we had theta double dot, and we had psi double dot minus omega d dot. And remember, this is just Kepler's law. Capitals omega is angular rate as we move through the orbit, and we're assuming a circular orbit. The analysis gets more complicated for elliptical orbits, but hey, more for people studying attitude dynamics.
We can rewrite LG. We're using the 321 Euler angles, yaw, pitch, and roll. But assuming that the O frame, the orbital frame, is aligned with the B frame. So yaw is the same thing. It's rotation about that number three direction, pitch, and then roll is the last one, right? just as a refresher. We want to write RC, the vector, we want to write RC1, RC2, and RC3 in terms of Euler angles. So RC, rewriting it from up there, RC1, RC2, RC3. If we want to write this in terms of the orbit frame, and hopefully it's clear, right? This is the orbit frame, RC, orbit frame, zero, zero, one. The B to O direction cosine matrix, do zero, zero, RC. And this is just the typical three by three rotation matrix written in terms of top pitch and roll angles. All right, so when we do that, you multiply through, then we get that this is the body fixed frame, right? This is just the O3 because it's the O3 direction. It means we're basically just picking out this third column. So negative sine theta, sine phi, cosine theta, cosine phi, cosine theta, times the scalar RC. So this leads to then LG, what we wrote up above. We've got these components, RC1, RC2, RC3, written in terms of the yaw pitch and roll angles. So this simplifies, we'll actually get three GME. We had RC to the fifth, and then we'll get RC squared. So this will become RC to the third. And then I'll write this in terms of I3 minus I2, cosine squared. You collect some things, use a trig identity, this is sine two phi. And then the next one is minus I1 minus I3, cosine phi sine two theta. And then this is minus I2 minus I1, sine phi sine two theta. There's a double angle formula being used over here. And this is all in the B frame. And you look at this and you go, oh, hey, what do you know? It's the same as this up here. It's Kepler's law. We could just rewrite part of this term, this one, as just capital omega squared. Very nice. Notice there's no dependence on yaw, which was psi. I've got my spacecraft and this is the local normal. And this is the yaw direction. That yaw direction right, does not affect the torque, only pitch and roll. And why is that? Because that brings some parts closer to the earth and some parts further away, whereas rotating this way does not. So that's just something to notice. So if we now linearize this, I'm going to linearize about the zero, zero, zero configuration. So we're saying that that means we only keep terms that are leading order, just like last time, you know, cosine of something just goes to one sine of something like X goes to X and we drop everything else. So lots of these things are going to drop out, which is good. Let me use squiggles. I always want to use squiggles. It's approximately three omega squared. This bottom term is just zero. So I like that. Uh, I3 minus I2 phi. There should have been like a factor of two somewhere. Yeah, I think there was a factor of two. Sorry about that. Because of the double angle formula. So then we would have two phi divided by two goes to zero. Okay, so this thing was actually three halves omega squared. There's a lot. I'm trying. This is minus I1 minus I3. As long as you get everything right before the mission takes off. And notice the linearized torque will never even have a yaw component. No yaw component. So up here, we were just noticing there was no dependence on yaw. And we're noticing here, linearizing, there's not even a yaw component to the torque. Two separate things. So now we've got everything we need to, if I sneak up here, to now write this completely in terms of Euler angles and assuming small Euler angles. So for small, yaw, pitch, and roll. There's still another step for linearization. We'll have I1 times phi double dot plus omega yaw dot. In that matrix equation, it's actually three scalar ODEs. So we're writing those three scalar ODEs. Okay, the first thing comes from that negative tilde i times omega, and we get this. 
from that multiplication, theta dot plus omega psi dot minus omega phi, and then the part that's due to the gravity gradient, which is three omega squared I three minus I two phi. The others are equally bad. Actually, this one isn't so bad. Then this is minus I one minus I three psi dot minus omega phi, phi dot plus omega psi minus, so now we're putting in the gravity gradient, three omega squared I one minus I three theta. Okay, now what? I three psi double dot minus omega phi dot equals minus I two minus I one phi dot plus omega psi theta dot plus phi. And there's no component due to the gravity gradient. Now, these expressions contain products of angles and angular rates that we're assuming are small. So these equations can be simplified further. So any term second order or higher in small values, and we're assuming that, you know, the the roll, pitch, yaw, and their rates are all small. Anything that's second order or higher in that, we just neglect. Basically, we set it equal to zero. Look at this pitch equation. Pitch equation, right, we'll have this multiplied by this. That'll go away. We'll have this multiplied by this. That'll go away. This multiplied by this. So this, this whole thing is just going to go away because it's all second order. Over here, though, we got something that's first order. So maybe look first at the pitch equations. Anyone hear like a instrument in the background? I hear something. I do. <laughs> this is my son practicing saxophone. I could tell him to stop, but you know, maybe it's kind of, no. kind of groovy. That's the atmosphere. Yes, it's like jazz. This is improvisational derivations. So he could do his improvisational saxophone. Is that a question? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, so above that uh, LG equation you had, you had originally written three halves omega squared, but then that doesn't really carry down through. I was wondering where that one half term was. Oh, yeah, yeah. I hear you. So sine of two phi is approximated by two phi. Ah, okay. Same for this. So all those twos then come on out and cancel. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So the factor of one half came from the double angle formula, and then the small angle formula brings back to two, and it's gone, so yeah. So we're looking first at the pitch equations because this sort of middle term I've highlighted in red, it's got all second order and small things, so it will, those will all go away. And what we're left with is, I'll put it this way, I'll write, I did not mean to zoom, I'll put the I2 to the other side. I'll bring everything over. So this is theta double dot plus three omega squared I1 minus I3 over I2 theta. And so now this should be highly recognizable as things that we've seen, right? This looks exactly like X double dot plus KX equals zero. And you need K greater than zero for stability because that means it'll be a restoring force. It'd be like a positive stiffness for a spring. If you had negative stiffness for a spring, the further away you get from equilibrium, the further it wants to go. Mathematically, we have a condition now for at least stability and pitch. Maybe let's call this omega P squared. Stability and pitch requires that omega P squared, which is three omega squared, I1 minus I3 over I2 greater than zero. Omega squared is definitely greater than zero. I2, all of these things, I1, I2, and I3, all of the moments of inertia are greater than zero. So this means that we need I1 greater than I3. Now remember, in terms of the orbit frame, I'll bring up the Earth. Earth. Okay, so there's some orbit frame. Orbit frame. Oh, you can't even see it. There it is. Um, this is the direction of the orbit. This is the vertical, and this is the normal to the orbit. 
let me just show something next to the earth. So we need that I1 is greater than I3. If we go back up here, I'm just gonna show the orbital frame. So the moment of inertia about I1 needs to be greater than the moment of inertia uh, about the number three direction. So what would that mean? That would mean we could have, if this is the earth, I could have the kind of long axis pointing away and that would be greater than in the O1 direction. That's just for stability and pitch. We should probably say some more things about pitch. Let's just give a picture. Here's the earth and I'll do a side view. So this is the orbit frame, our local normal, it's O3, O2, O2 is coming out of the screen, and then O1. The moment of inertia about the O1 axis, so that means we need a lot of mass kind of normal to the O1 axis compared to the mass that's normal to the O3 axis. That would lead to stability. And if you were to tilt this somewhat, there'll be a restoring torque to bring it back. So this exactly matches hopefully the intuition about the dumbbell. You've got a really large moment of inertia about this O1 direction, small about O3. So if it goes this way, it's gonna restore. If we had it this way, now we've got something really large in the O3 direction and something really small. This is unstable. So think of the dumbbell or your phone. Here's your phone orbiting through space. You could do this, you could do this. Those will both be stable in pitch. I wonder how many phones are floating through space. I wanna say some other things about pitch because it is notable what happens in this direction when you are close to the earth. So low altitude, there's environmental forces and torques. We've gone on and on about one of the main ones, the torque due to gravity, but there are others. This is showing the accelerations, right? Forces per unit mass on a spacecraft at different altitudes. So there's the primary gravity. This is a log scale vertical scales log. So primary gravity is like the top. And if we're at an orbit of like 400, which is, you know, where the, the space station is. So if we're right here, we can kind of follow this up. See, what are the major forces? J2. J2 doesn't affect torques, at least not on the time scales that we care about. And then there's all these other J3, J4, J5. So these are related to the distributions of mass in the earth. But then you get down to drag. Now actually drag can be, it's a lot more uncertain than this plot lets on. It depends on your exposed projected area in the direction of your orbit. So even up at 400 kilometers, there's enough of an atmosphere to create an aerodynamic torque even if it's not a major contributor to the orbit. For large things, right, like the space station, this leads to degradation of the orbit. But the, the effect that we care about is the effect on the torque. So one of the main ones is the aerodynamic torque. And we might just write it this way. I'm not gonna go into the details of how to compute it. It is related to that projected area, but it's good to know that it's typically not zero. It depends on where the center of pressure is in the body compared to the center of mass. So if I'm going through space and I have a center of pressure here, then that's gonna to lead to like a torque downward. But of course that could be balanced by the torque due to the gravity gradient. So basically where torques balance, this leads to a deviation from the zero pitch condition. Torques balance, one gets T E A, torque equilibrium angle. And it could depend on you know, how you're deploying solar panels and things. So if we try to understand this in terms of the space station, here's the space station in a side view. So orbit is going. So now we're looking at it from the direction of uh, how it's orbiting, right? As it moves those solar panels, that gives an increase in aerodynamic torque. They don't have much mass, so they're not changing the mass distribution, but they do lead to increased you know, drag torque. All right, so there's the torque balance. I want to give you an idea because this determines the torque equilibrium angle. If we're in this condition where there's stability, uh, let's go back to that torque equation, IT, theta double dot. This is the torque equation for pitch. Why are we focusing on pitch? Pitch is that angle of deflection that's going to be affected by any kind of aerodynamic torque. If our orbit is going this way, then 
drag going to be going that way. And it's mostly going to be drag. I mean, maybe there's some component of lift, but we mostly worry about drag. And even small drag over many orbits. And you're going really fast, right? You know the formula for a drag. It's like density times velocity squared. And you're like, well, the density is small. Yeah, but velocity is immense. So it could be significant. So what do we get here? We get minus three omega squared I1 minus I3. And now let's add in that there could be a torque due to aerodynamics. We've been calling this what LG. So this is like LG2. Oh, wait, I, I need to put in the dependence on theta. I'm going to say this is delta LG2 delta theta. If we were to plot for the stable condition, I1 greater than I3, plotting LG2, but only for small theta. For small theta, this will be a curve that goes down like this. How do we interpret this? If we're at a positive theta, we have a negative torque, so it's actually restoring us back. If we had a negative theta, well, now we have a positive torque, again, bringing us back. In terms of figuring out where the balance point is, right, so for this, we have what? That delta LG2 delta theta is negative. It's restoring. If this was a if this was torque, then think of you know, right here would be the negative of our torque. For torque balance, we need that this right hand side is zero. And that's at what we'll call our equilibrium angle. So set this equal to zero. We've got theta torque equilibrium angle equals negative the torque due to aerodynamics divided by delta LG to delta theta. And what was delta LG to delta theta? It is negative three omega squared I1 minus I3. So what, once you get that, you could figure out what the equilibrium angle is, if you know what its moments are. I think if we were to follow these curves out further, right, and this is always in radians, you got to do this in radians, it, you know, it reaches a maximum and it goes back down. But we're only looking, we're kind of linearizing about zero. So then this would be the, you know, theta torque equilibrium angle. For this case, if we had a destabilizing torque, the aerodynamics might actually stabilize it. Okay, so that's enough about pitch. We've said what we need to know about pitch. So if you're asked, what are the stable attitudes? We haven't yet figured out completely. We know that I1 needs to be greater than I3. We don't know where I2 fits in. Is it greater than I1? Is it between these two? This is the square of your frequency and you need this greater than zero. So you need this. So this is the period of oscillations. If you start out with a little bit of a perturbation, there'll be these oscillations in pitch which would lead to then periods of pitch. And hopefully everyone knows how to. So that was for pitch. Yaw and roll are not as easy. If we, I guess I need to go back up here to see what's going on. This is the roll and this is yaw. Why do I call this roll? Because the second order derivative is roll. And then this is yaw. And we have terms here like this thing will multiply times omega and it'll be just first order and something small. And then this thing will multiply by this and again, give us something first order. And it'll be same thing up, up here. So these terms don't just go to zero. And then over here, we got something else going on. All right, so we'll collect those two terms. So this is the, the roll and the yaw. You notice that they are coupled. So the dynamics in roll and yaw depend on each other. Pitch was decoupled from them both. So pitch equations at least for small deflections away from equilibrium are decoupled from roll and yaw. And then roll and yaw become another problem for us because they are coupled. And if you collect them into a form that is amenable to analysis, you will get something. And this is just the, the linearized ones, right? Linearized. Dropping all terms that are second order and things that are very small, you'll get roll double dot, yaw double dot plus, and now we've got a two by two matrix, zero omega one minus a new thing that I'll define as KY. And then over here it's omega KR. They're kind of like effective stiffnesses. And this is what the literature uses. This is times V dot psi dot. The inertia ratios that we use KR is I two minus I one. 
over i3, ky is i2 minus i3 over i1. Uh, we haven't yet finished this. Then we have another two by two for omega squared ky is zero omega squared kr. This is times roll and yaw. This is moving over. And this just equals zero, zero. To study the stability of something that's coupled like this, I don't know if this was covered in dynamics and control, but we can assume an exponential solution. So we're going to assume that phi as a function of time and psi as a function of time are, they've got some initial conditions times an exponential. And then we plug that in to these coupled ODEs and we'll get a characteristic equation for what the lambdas are. It looks kind of like an eigenvalue problem, but what do we get? We get lambda to the fourth plus lambda squared omega squared one plus three k y plus k y k r plus four omega squared k y k r equals zero. And this looks like it's a polynomial, a fourth order polynomial, but notice we only have lambda the fourth and lambda squared. If we let x equal lambda squared, then this can be rewritten as x squared plus, let me move this down, b1x plus b0 equals zero. And then it's a really simple formula that we could solve with the quadratic equation. So this term is what we mean by b1, and this term is what we mean by b0. So you can solve by the quadratic formula, x equals one half, right, minus b1 plus or minus square root of b1 squared minus four b naught. Now we need to check which conditions guarantee that no root of this has positive real components. So the solutions will be x is lambda squared. We assumed an exponential up here. If lambda is real, we have instability. So that means if lambda squared is greater than zero, we have instability. However, if lambda is complex, that means lambda equals like an i omega, then e to the i omega t is, is actually sinusoidal and that's stability. If lambda equals i omega, then that means lambda squared is less than zero. So this is what we want. That means we want both roots of x to be less than zero. And we can check for that. You could write it in terms of what the signs of b, b1, b squared minus 4, b naught, but all of those have to be. The conditions for both roots to have lambda squared less than zero are b naught needs to be greater than zero, b1 needs to be greater than zero, b1 squared, the thing inside that square root minus four b naught needs to be greater than zero. And all of these can be written in terms of those ratios, kr and ky. So this is equivalent to kr, ky is greater than zero. One plus three ky plus kr, ky is greater than zero. And this other one is pretty weird. One plus three ky plus kr. KY squared is greater than 16 KY, KR. Also from before, KY needs to be greater than KR. That's equivalent to what we already had from before. This was the pitch stability. We want everything to be stable. So this is for yaw and roll stability. If we have that, then we'll have what we want. It means that I2 is greater than both I1 and I three, or I2 is less than I1 and I3. And we already know how they're related. So if we have that, then um, we could write down what the frequencies are. And it's not like there's, because yaw and roll are coupled, it's not like we're getting a frequency for roll and a frequency for yaw. They're both coupled and they might be moving in some kind of interesting way but there are still two frequencies. So the oscillations in the coupled yaw roll dynamics are, if I look at those roots up above, I'd call them omega one and omega two are square root negative lambda one 
two. So this just means square root of one half b1 plus or minus square root of b1 squared minus 4b0. We could also summarize these conditions over here in terms of a diagram. You could call it the gravity gradient stability chart, where we're just looking at the regions in kr, ky space, those two parameters that lead to stability or instability. Let me show the uh, gravity gradient stability chart. The regions that are shaded are not good. They're not stable. Shaded regions are unstable. The regions that are unshaded, there's two of them, and they correspond to those two conditions up above. This one called region one, this is where I2 is greater than I1, which we already know is greater than I3. So that means the moment of inertia along the I2 direction, that's the one normal to the orbital plane, that's the largest moment of inertia. This is the one that's commonly used. It's commonly used because due to kind of nonlinear effects that I can't really go into, it's stable even when there's energy dissipation due to vibrating parts of the structure. That would be the condition for stability that I want you to look at. The other one, it's unstable when you add energy dissipation for reasons that are complex. But this one has I1 is greater than I3 and it's greater than I2. So I2 is actually the smallest. So maybe we would just hash that and say kind of unstable. Don't use due to vibrating parts of the structure, it will go unstable. This one is called the Lagrange region, which is fun. I think it must have been Lagrange who did an analysis like this. I honestly don't know. So that would be the condition. So if we had this thing and let's call the orbital direction uh, that way, this is the stable configuration. Your phone, your phone is easy because, right, it's got the largest moment of inertia through this way. And this is the orbit normal. So coming out of the screen, that's the orbit normal. And then I1 is actually the intermediate axis. So this is actually going along on the intermediate axis, this iPhone. So phones going through space. If they want to be stable, gravity gradient stabilized, they'll go this way. Excuse me, professor. Yeah. So I know that uh, we refer to bodies like this as unstable when uh, k is less than zero uh, and as stable when it's greater than zero what what is what do we say it is when it's equal to zero we would say it's neutrally stable ah yeah so yeah that's why i'm making these uh inequalities rather than greater than or equal plus you're not likely to have that situation yeah right that just machine precision won't even allow that. Yeah, like I guess you're thinking, what if theta double dot is just equal to zero? It means there's no oscillatory motion. And it probably means that that's just zero times the, the, the linear term. And there's going to be some second order term. I don't even know what to call that. And then that will dominate. And so that could, that'll lead to some nonlinear dynamics. So you're thinking of just the linear term goes away, but then there's all the nonlinear stuff, which you would then have to look at. Does that make sense? It does. Uh, thank, yeah. thank you. Um, I just want to ask a quick question. Are these equations we derived, are they only valid for the three, two, one that we started with, or these, I guess the second half, all generic? We use the yaw, pitch, and roll to get at this, but this is true, independent of how you look at the kinematics. We just used yaw, pitch, and roll for convenience. Okay, thank you. The phone going through space this way, it's gonna be stable, no matter how you think about it. So I thought in the last little bit, we could talk about an application of this to the space station. Like, look, look at this, oh my goodness. Oh, it's made up of so many parts and they all have their own moments of inertia. Let's try this on the International Space Station. First of all, is it near an equilibrium condition and is it in the stable one? You know what the space station looks like. It looks like this. Check it out. Now there's this whole video that somebody made of putting all the parts in. Pretty neat. There's all this documentation about the space station. So this is a handbook of what the space station looked like in 2008, right? And it's got all these things about the parts, all the details of every part, including the inertia tensor. And they've, all, they've also set up the, uh, what the reference frame is for us. Is this the one that I like? Yeah, I think I like this one. 
I really don't like this drawing. It's kind of lame. The spacecraft is going in this direction. That's the orbital direction. So that's what they're calling X, X. And then there's down. They're calling that Z. And then I let's see to complete the right-handed coordinate system this way is Y. So that's what they've set up as their coordinate system. And I think it basically aligns with like these directions of the structure, but those aren't necessarily the principal axis directions. To get to the principal axis directions, you need to do some more things. So it says for that configuration up above, like here's the total mass, here's where the center of mass is with respect to something. Um, and then here's the inertia tensor and forget about slug, per you know, square feet, think metric. Otherwise things will start crashing. Just please do metric. So this is the moment of inertia tensor with respect to that X, Y, Z body fixed frame on the space station. And look, they've even already calculated the moments of inertia. And then what the yaw pitch and roll sequence is, it's different from the yaw pitch and roll that we defined. They're doing Z down, okay? You could see these are in degrees and it's very small. So the X, Y, and Z are pretty close to the yaw pitch and roll. So this is showing the space station as it's moving through, how it, they've defined X, Y, and Z. They've got this control moment gyroscope and you might go, well, why do they need that if the gravity gradient stabilized? If you were to color in those axes, we've got some principal axes here and you notice they're not exactly aligned. <laughs> so that, that green one isn't exactly aligned. So that's the principal axis. Is it the intermediate? Right, this is the direction of the orbit. If I were to label it, I get this. So the direction of the orbit is the intermediate axis, which is good. I said that was, that was good, but the local vertical is actually I max, and it's supposed to be I min for this to be in the gravity gradient stabilized attitude. So it's not stabilized. It is at an equilibrium. It's just at an unstable equilibrium. That's why there's that control moment gyroscope it's good to be near an equilibrium because just with a little bit of torque, you could stabilize it, but that is why they have that. Plus the space station violates some of the assumptions we made, which is that we have a rigid structure. There are whirling gizmos. There's also people walking around and bouncing off things. There's the panels moving. So there's a lot of motion on this thing. It is not perfectly rigid. And so that's why you would need a control moment gyroscope. We'll get back to the space station. There was something launched, I think in the eighties, it's called the long duration exposure facility, roughly a bus sized thing. And it, it was gravity gradient stabilized, it was put out by the space shuttle. There were a bunch of experiments on it and they left it out there for, I think several years and then collected it again. It's kind of cool. And you can see it's, maybe it's hard to see, it is pointing up and down like this can. It's got its long axis. So the minimum moment of inertia axis aligned with the local vertical. So if it had even a little aerodynamic torque or something, it's stable. It might wobble a little bit, but it's stable. It's not going to flip. So that's good. There were others. You can put out a large boom. This isn't very big. This is like as big as a trash can, but then they put out this long um, kind of rigid thing and a mass at the end. This was, it's called OU Sat, University of Surrey satellite. There's this university in England that I've been to, and it's kind of like they've got this mini JPL that puts up little spacecraft for you know, Britain and all kinds of different countries who just want to have a little spacecraft up there. And they used the gravity gradient stabilization. We can calculate things for the space station, I guess, if we wanted to. They have to figure out the moment of inertia for all kinds of different configurations. Uh, when something's docking, when the panels are going full blown. So here's the inertia tensor for just one particular configuration. You could just read off of here. The things along the diagonal are at least an order of magnitude greater than the off diagonal elements. So that means the X, Y, and Z that they have are pretty close to the principal axes. And I'm, I'm sure that was by design. What's the largest? The Z. And we said for it to be gravity gradient stabilized, that needs to be the minimum, but it's not. So that's why they have that control moment gyroscope. The control moment gyroscope, it's big. As this thing turns inside that black casing is a flywheel and it is massive. And this is near the center of mass. So 
as that thing turns to conserve angular momentum, the entire craft turns as well. So that's what control moment gyroscopes do. And space station, it has its B1, B2, and B3 parallel to the orbital. I just mean it's parallel to these frames. These, that doesn't mean these are exactly aligned directions. It just means the frames are parallel. What does that mean that for frames to be parallel? You might be wondering. Like this is parallel. Uh, this is parallel. Even like this is parallel. I mean, some direction is either pointing in the same direction or the total opposite direction. So that's what we mean. And so it's in one of those, it's very close. So it is near a gravity gradient equilibrium, but it's in an unstable equilibrium. So if you have an unstable equilibrium, that means you need another control system. There must've been some other design constraint that led to this. So another attitude control is needed. In this case, a control moment gyroscope, which is something that would need to be covered in a more advanced class on attitude dynamics. Control moment gyroscopes are what are used to maintain the Hubble Space Telescope pointing at some very precise part of the sky. So I think that's it for today. I think next time it's the last time we meet and maybe I'll say something about control moment gyroscopes. I also wanted to uh, analyze that the docking scene from Interstellar. So if you haven't seen Interstellar, you know, watch it or don't. <laughs>